All right, guys, I'm here with Mike Jamboretz of Jambo Sport Fishing. Mike recently gave a seminar about deep water Chinook fishing, and he has some great information in this entire seminar. So if you miss parts one through three, make sure you go back and watch those before you watch part four. Now, Mike, in this last part of the seminar, you lots of great information, but you hit on a couple things that really stood out in my mind. Um, and let's just talk about lever drag reels. There's a lot of folks that fish the rivers, fish Puget Sound, and don't do ocean salmon fishing, and they probably have no idea why they would want to fish lever drag reels. Probably one of the biggest things about a lever drag that makes it a, a big bonus on, on this type of fishing is when we're stocking downriggers, is being able to get back to that pre-adjusted that, uh, pre drag, okay? So uh, I'm gonna stick one one rod down and I'm gonna flip the lever up just to hold it there and as, as I'm running both downriggers down at the same time, I know when I hit there all I've gotta do is flip that lever up into the fighting position and both both reels are ready to roll. If you did that with a star drag, you're gonna to have to stop and adjust it and feel it every time. And that's, that's the beauty of a lever drag, really. So guys, if you're unfamiliar with lever drag reels, go check them out. Lots of manufacturers sell lever drag reels. And that kind of segues into something else that he starts talking about in this part of the seminar, and that's stacking. If you've been a little nervous about stacking your downriggers, pay special attention in this part of the seminar because Mike has great information on that. But if you did a short boom, I could see it. But having that thing way out there, you're just adding it to so much stress on that downrigger. I fish 15s for that reason. But, that, but you can do it if you go with the current. So what you're going to do in this scenario is you're going to, Let's see, I don't know, what have I got going here? Okay, how do you find the direction of the current? Turn the boat off, put it in neutral, leave the chart plotter on, go down and visit with your guests, visit with your buddy, go use the head, come back a few minutes later, which way did the boat go? You're gonna have a line right on your, on your screen, that's the current. And, it's, and sometimes the wind and current combined, but at any rate, that's the way you're gonna have to go. Okay, now you know where you saw that bait, you saw that concentration of bait back up by that contour line up there or by a couple dots that you had on your screen. You're going to run up there and you see there's where that bait is. It's right in, it's right in this spot here. I'm going to get above it because I know which, what, what the current is. I'm going to go exactly what that, what that current is. You can, you, can, you can even get the compass course off that. You, know? you see that line on the screen, you know what you did. So you can do the reciprocal course to get up to the top of it, turn around and do the course to go down through the bait. And then you can get down. Okay. All right, getting down there, it's easiest, as we all agree, two rods, no tangles, right? The minimum amount of tangles, you're gonna have your, your maximum spread plus the width of the boat. Uh, you got done the best you can, okay? When you have more, more anglers on the boat like I do, I wanna get more gear in the water, okay? How am, I, how am I gonna put four rods on there on two downriggers? I'm not gonna do three because I already know that that, that middle ball can, can still crisscross. So the way I do it is by stacking. Uh, stacking is nothing new. There's nothing new about stacking. It's something that everybody in Puget Sound probably hates, right? Because if one, one pops off, the other guy's got to come up, you know? Uh, guys have only two downriggers on the boat and there's three guys on the boat. Well, we can stack another one on here. It's a pain in the butt. But when you learn how to do it efficiently, it's not that bad and you're going to catch a lot more fish getting a lot more gear in the water. Okay, so I'll put four downriggers down. Uh, I don't use cable. I use the 200 pound, actually I'm using Power Pro uh, uh, Spectra braided line, okay? Same fishing line, I, but I use 200 pound fishing line braided. It's a thinner profile than the, than the wire is. It'll stay down at a little, little bit better scope. It's not blowing back quite as bad. Uh, they make, Scotty makes some white braid. I, that I've got it on some of my downriggers uh, for shallow water stuff. It's actually fatter than the cable it blows back even farther, so it's, that's, it's no good. That's why we went to the, the thin fishing line, the Power Pro. Okay, stacking downriggers. Okay, here we go. What I've done here, I've got non-buoyant or heavier lures get clipped on first, okay? I'm gonna run them down 30 or 40 feet or wherever I've set up my next two set of stops. Okay, in this case, I, I like to run mine 40 feet apart when we're fishing deep like that. Then I'm gonna clip on the next lures are gonna be lighter lures or a floating lure. So you can run spoons top and bottom, 
but make sure you run the heavier spoon than the bottom. So they sink and the little guys will flutter down, they won't tangle. Okay. There's your stack release. Basically, I'm just taking the, the Scotty stops and I come down, I come I come up the line 40 feet, or come down the line 40 feet, however you want to look at it, and I'll spread them a couple, you know, six inches apart like that. That gives me a place to clip this on right here. This is how I make my releases. This is weed whacker line. Okay. I make them long like this. I can clip this baby on there. Uh, if I want to check my lures, the reason I have these long is twofold. You're going to see a, you're going to see a bite. But the main reason I like these is I can, if I want to check to see if my gear is running great, if I don't have any grass on the lure or I got a shaker on there, if I have to come up and check it, I can keep this thing clipped on. I can raise my rod up like that and I can see the darn thing. Okay. Also, when I'm clipping on, I can have the ball in the water and I can have this thing clipped on and I can reach this thing from the boat. Okay. Uh, as I said, this is a weed whacker line and it's just a standard trolling snap. You can get these at any commercial fishing store. But uh, that's the setup right there. The trick to Power Pro, a couple drops of super glue. The, the Scotty line, uh, you guys that fish wire on your downrigger, you'll notice that the stops that, that go through the gate that shut the Scotties off, they're kind of a, a, a chartreuse color, green. Those things don't have as many uh, notches to go around on your wire, basically one notch. The ones for braid, they've got double the notches that you have to wind that wire through so that they don't slide up the line. If you're using Power Pro line, it's thinner than Scotty braid and it's going to slide anyway. So a couple drops, not much, but just a couple drops of super glue on there will keep them from sliding. The other thing you're going to do is you're going to come up about eight feet and put another stop so that when you're coming up to check your gear, you don't want that thing going into the pulley. Okay, So you've got to put an, another standard stop on just like you would for your downrigger on the bottom. Okay, getting down without the tangles, okay. Uh, I kind of described this on the, on the handout. It kind of goes step by step, but basically it's what, everything I'm going to say right here. So you're going to run your, uh, your first set of gear on. You're going to clip it onto the, on the gear. Uh, okay, well, I guess obviously you've got to do your course. You deploy your first set of gear. So you're going to snap on your first set of gear, whatever you're going to run on the bottom. Clip those on, run them down, put the rod into the rod holder. Now, here's another thing I didn't really talk about, but when you're fishing four rods on your boat, down uh, rod holder placement's really kind of critical. And, okay, once you get that gear down, you're going to run down till you get your, uh, till you see the second set of stops coming into view right there. I stop them halfway to the water. Uh, that works on a Scotty downrigger really well. When you lift that boom up, it's going to put them right here at a convenient place. You're not reaching for them. You're not jumping overboard for them. Uh, that's how it works on my boat, just the dist our distance from the water. Then you're going to clip on, you're going to do your drop back distance on your second set uh, and clip the release between the beads. And uh, once again, you can either hold on to this one and thumb it down, or, but what works really good is just to set the drag on both of them. Use the machine, put them both in the rod holder. They're both loaded or have a little bit of load on them. Pull the lever on the Scotty or turn on the cannon, whichever you're, whatever you're fishing with, and let them just go down together. Let the machine pull the line off the fishing reel, and they'll go down together. When you get to the depth you want to go, reach over there and shut, that, shut the machine off and, and then tighten your drags up. I use, well, we'll get into it there. There we go. One of the things I, I, I use a lever drag reel. Hang on to that for a bit. This thing works awesome on a, on a downrigger when you're doing this stacking because you can preset. This thing goes up. The, the lever goes up till it hits that stop. I've got my drag adjusted for kings right there. It's tight. Okay. If I'm to back that off, if I back that off to use the downrigger down, if you did that with a star drag, you'd have to set the drag every single time to, to where you want it when you when you have enough drag on there. With the lever drag, you've already preset it. You just flip it up, you're, boom, you're there. They're awesome. I've learned over the years of having to do a whole lot of drag replacements on my reels because I would, I would put a lot of tension on here so that rod's loaded all the way down. When it gets to the spot that I want to stop, I stop the downrigger, flip these up, and the rods are already loaded. 
I, th I think, man, this is just great. All my rods are loaded. I don't have to stop and crank the load back in. I was going through drags like crazy. Think about it. When do you use your drag? When a fish pulls it out, okay? If you do it every single time you deploy your gear, you're getting a lot of a big workout. And I was going through drags like crazy. Now, on the, on the lever drag reels, there's a little button here that knocks it out of gear. I pull them just to where just above that and let the line come off. It comes off easy. Uh, the rod's not loaded, but when you're fishing with braided line, about three cranks, you're loaded anyway because there's no stretch to that line. Doing monofilament, it, it's going to take a while to get the load back where you want it. But that's the beauty of the lever drag reels, is being able to flip them right back up. And as I said here, you're going to keep the rod in the rod holder, run them down. Okay, where's my... Okay. Best gear selection for offshore, you're going to use big stuff, period. Uh, the 142R always catches fish. I didn't bring one tonight, but I think I've got a picture of one. But uh, you're going to use the bigger profile one. You might use these cuttlefish. They've got the little uh, goofy head on them, look like a squid. Anything that glows. You're fishing deep. The, the fish have to see your lure, okay? So fish anything that glows. Medium to large spoons. That five-inch yellowtail is absolutely awesome. I mean, I'm not just selling that thing. It's, it works. Uh, I didn't bring the superiors. The superior is a pretty big spoon. Uh, the number eight is not actually eight inches. That's an, that's an error on my part, but anyway. Uh, you're going to fish mostly seven-inch plugs. I said all three colors. Do they only make three colors for plugs? I mean, come on. Uh, I think so. I think you need a white one. I think you need something blue, and you need something green, okay? Whatever the variation is. You don't need a, all these goofy things with all these fancy paint jobs. It's, you just need those three colors, okay? Uh, I'm fishing herring offshore. I don't do it a lot, but if I do, I'm fishing big, big herring, and I'm going to fish them whole, okay? Uh, we just talked, to, I showed you the reel. On these reels, there's 100 feet of high visibility monofilament on top of 40 pound braid, okay? When I first started doing this, this technique of trying to get down to where these fish are, I fish in straight monofilament. Here's what happens. You get down there, the spool on your reel is about the size of my thumb. That's how much line's left on your reel. That's not a very good idea if your fish decides you're going to go swimming, okay? You can't keep up with them. You don't have any speed on your retrieve when it's that small. The bigger your spool, the faster you're going to get line back on that reel, okay? Uh, here we go. The good... On, it, on, on the braided line, when, you're, when I was fishing monofilament, we could be dragging a, a yellowtail rockfish or something. Uh, you don't see the bite. Even with these big long releases, you've got such a huge blowback in that monofilament line. It's, it's blowing back and it's absorbing everything that's happening down there. When we would get fish on, people would, on my boat would think I'm nuts. I'd say, there's a fish on number three. You know, I get four rods across the back and it's still bent. But it's, but it, and I never saw that. Nobody saw that. But what you do see, it's starting to rise now. It's off the clip. It's all, it, that bite, every, every indicator of that bite's been absorbed by that huge belly in your line of that monofilament. It stretches, and it's got a lot of pull to it. Uh, so the, the braided line doesn't give you a piece of bite, right? Yeah, yeah. This braided line, this, this reel right here has braided line on it, but it's got 100 feet of the green on the top. Uh, it gives you a little bit of stretch, and it gives you some good visibility. Okay, we talked about there's lots of, there still have, you'd be surprised how much line's left on the reel when you're down 500 feet. You've got a lot of line left with braided line. Uh, there's not a lot of bad about it. It lasts a long time, so the, the cost is not that big of a deal, but when you go to switch over, it's pretty expensive, you know. Uh, it's hard to see if you're using the green braided line. Uh, and there's no stretch. The reason that there's no stretch is bad, it takes out reels a lot. You get a big king on there and he blasts that thing, that impact back to that reel to the anti-reverse dog, it'll blow him right off these Shimano sometimes. And uh, yeah, it's just something you gotta deal with. So there's a there's a blow up. That's the 142 Hoochie, twinkle glow twinkle skirt, and a glow mini hoochie. And I'm fishing that behind a red flasher. Every flasher I put in the water has got glow on one side. We talked about this earlier. When this thing rotates, 
it's making noise, it's, it's imparting the, the, the action to the lure, but it's going like that. They're not going to see that, but they're going to see that because every time you come up and check your gear, you're putting that, they're turning this light on, charging that light thing up, it's glow in the dark, so it's going to look flash, flash, you see. It's going to get their attention and get them over there. That 142 hoochie, as I said, it glows in the dark. It's just, it's just really consistent. If I didn't know where, where to, what to fish a new place with, I'd put that on first because they do work. Okay. You, you pack and fold it the, the pink mini as the yep. skirt. Yep. I slide, when I'm tied the hook, I slide the mini on first, then a twinkle skirt, and then, then the hoochie. And you use that glow all day long, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Typically use a camera flash to glow those things. You can, yeah. But there's nothing better than sunlight. Mm -hmm. so every time you bring your lure up, the question was, do you use a camera flash? I said, some people do, I don't. I, I told you I have those, uh, my dragon eyes are on. If I, wanna, if I wanna charge my plug up, I'll stick it up there on the rod and I'll get a, give it a little extra light. Cause I've got some really bright uh, LED lights, but anyway. Yellowtail spoon, those things would work awesome out there in the deep. They work in any depth. Okay, you're gonna see a lot of pictures here at the end. Yellowtail spoon. Both those fish were over 30 pounds. They were both caught on that spoon. You can run that spoon solo, or you can run it behind a flasher. If you run it behind, anytime you run a spoon behind a flasher, you want to get it back to about four feet. So the leader length behind a flasher for a spoon, because it's got its own action, you don't want the flasher whipping it around. You want the flasher getting them to look at that spoon that's four feet back there. This is Shelly Brogdon. Her and her husband fish near Bay a lot. Like they come out on a Thursday night and they leave on a Sunday, religiously, all season long. Uh, Michael is actually the guy that designed uh, the, the Pilot House North River boat. He designed it when he worked for Almar, and the whole time he was, he was running a sea sport and taking crap from his bosses. So anyway, they fish a lot. I gave them each one of these spoons. <laughs> Shelly fished hers and kept catching fish like that. Michael was getting skunked and he thought he, he thought that he just absolutely sucked. He didn't know what was wrong with him. He thought he had the stink going and he tried everything. He tried everything in the box and that spoon was out fishing everything that they could throw in the water. These guys would come by a dock where we park and they go, look who we got today. Next day, look, we got another one. And they were catching fish in the high twenties and low thirties a lot. These guys right here, uh, that guy's really big. So that fish doesn't look that good. That fish was longer than that one, and these guys had a tremendous competition going between the two of them. They, they, they want to know whose fish was bigger. We weighed them. They were exactly the same. Yeah, couldn't find a difference in them. It's just, you know, how fish are sometimes shaped different. Different rivers fish, you know. But, yeah, that's the spoon. Okay, there's the Superior I was talking about. There's two versions. That's the 50-50, and this thing here with those colors work really good when we have a sardine run offshore. We haven't had those for quite a few years, but there used to be gigantic sardine runs out there, and that was a great color and a great size. There's a difference between the five and the seven inch uh, plugs. Uh, one, one thing you'll notice in the picture here, I learned this from one of my friends. This, uh, typically anything you read about a plug, they'll say tie your main line right to the tow bar or the, or the, the ring, okay? If you do that offshore and you catch a rockfish, and you don't see it, it'll twist that line all the way back to the tip of the rod. And now you're, now you're pulling off line. So put a barrel, you know, you can put a barrel swivel or a bead chain and just kind of treat it like you would a herring. And you still have a, you still have a line tied. You, you wouldn't want to hook a, a swivel or something onto this, but you're still tying a main line onto there in a sense. But, but putting that in line right there, putting that bead chain in there is going to keep that thing from twisting back up to the rod tip. Okay. The seven inch plugs, both of those fish right there were caught off the seven inch plugs. This one right here, this guy right there. In fact, you can see it in one picture, there it is. They were both caught on it. Those, that was a father and son and uh, they wanted to show their fish. I, 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 later in the year, those fish, the bigger Okay, the question is what time of the year do we catch bigger fish offshore? Typically August. July has the most amount of kings as far as big numbers go. June and July, late June and, and through the uh, middle of July in particular. Uh, as, the, as the season progresses, 
the peak of the run kind of dies out after July, but there's a lot, the fish that you do encounter are usually bigger if you go to the right spots, like this offshore that we're talking about. Uh, in July and August, is the, is the water predictable? No. 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 The question was, is the water predictable in July and August? It's better than it is in April. Okay. <laughs> Okay, folks, that wraps up this seminar series with Mike Jamboretz of Jambo Sport Fishing about deep water Chinook fishing. If you're interested in fishing with Mike, you've got to book well in advance because he gets super full. Go to his website at jambosportfishing.com. Thanks for watching.